I just have to trust in the Lord. So uh, I appreciate that this is here, and I feel so blessed to be part of this congregation. We're blessed to host this. And I want you to know that we have some lovely saints here in Cherryvale and that the gospel is preached and taught with boldness here. Amen. Thankful to my husband for being a willing vessel. Brother Dave preached last night a tremendous sermon on the law, and Brother Harold also touched on this, some of the things. And in God's law, we see a perfect and holy God. But we also see ourselves falling short of God's desired perfection. We see our need for a Savior who can give us access to this perfect and holy God. We see our need for help in living our lives in the footsteps of such a Savior. When Christ died on the cross, the veil to the Holy of Holies was rent in two. We now had that access. On the day of Pentecost, we were told what we must do to be saved, and we received the gift of the Holy Spirit. We now had the Helper. Does this mean that we no longer need the law? God forbid. It will not give us access to God, but we do need it to help show us the perfect and holy way to live. The world is certainly not going to show us. Even a good moral society eventually degenerates when they do not take advantage of the access to God and the helper he so graciously gives us. Look at the Israelites. Look at the church today. Brother Leon spoke so powerfully on that this morning. And when a dead religion is practiced, death is forthcoming. Amen. And this brings us to Jeremiah 31 and Hebrews 8 that we've heard often, but it's needed to be heard. Jesus is the living word. He is the word brought to life, and he is the word that brings life. It is through Jesus that God will put his laws on our minds and in our hearts. But God can put his laws, oh, but can God put his laws into our minds if they are filled with the trash of this world? Can he write his laws on our hearts if our hearts are struggling with the evil that we let into our minds? Is it possible for the laws of God to be written on our hearts when our minds are focused on the ways of the world? Can a carnal mind produce a spiritual heart? I know that with God all things are possible, yet in my life, it was not until my mind began to be renewed by the word of God that I was truly transformed. Mm -hmm. Romans 10:17 says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. God's word must first penetrate our minds if faith is to come forth from our hearts. When I was 21 years old, God led me to a group of Christians who truly loved God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, and with all their strength. I'd been seeking him, yet I'd been looking in the wrong places. And as I listened in on their Bible studies, they met almost daily, and saw the witness of their daily lives, there began to stir within me a longing for the things of God. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. As I thought more and more of a true, honest, and just God, the lies of Satan were crowded out as my mind awakened to the thoughts of God's truth, of God's holiness, of God's righteousness, I desired to know him in a greater way. Yet I would still go home or go with my old friends and watch or listen to or think on things that were not pure, not lovely, nor of good report. Can a carnal mind produce a spiritual heart? The battle was raging. What I thought of as fun, what I thought of as the norm, those I have thought of as friends, beckoned me. Yet now there were new things to think of. My new friends lived such a different life. They were somewhat peculiar. 
Then, just as God said, let there be light on the first day of creation, the light of God came into my life. God separated the light from the darkness, and I chose to follow the light. Praise God. As I began to think on the things which are true, honest and just, and pure, lovely and of good report, my heart's desire now was to live a life of virtue and praise to my God. The things that I both learned and heard and saw in these dedicated Christians, I began to do. Amen. And the God of peace was with me. Amen. Oh, how I praise God for those Christians who were not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Amen. Some say that Peter didn't really mean that we were to be a peculiar people, but they're wrong. Amen. <laughs> it was that peculiarity of those Christians that drew me to God. We are not going to win people to the Lord by sugarcoating the things of this world. To bring a holy God down to the level of the world is debasement. Amen. Amen. To present God as a cool dude is blasphemy. Amen. It is taking the hallowed, the holy name of God in vain when we sing his praises in an ungodly fashion. When our camps become a place for youth to act stupid in the Lord, and excuse the term, but that's a term used by a youth minister. When our Sunday schools become nothing more than milk factories, and when church growth programs are more important than spiritual growth, in the end, there is only death. What we win them with, we win them to. Amen. We have churches full of good people who have a form of godliness, but the power of God is denied. If people are to know the living God, the new and living way, then we must be living epistles. Amen. I praise God for his peculiar people. Instead of blending with the darkness, the Christians who showed me the way to God were beacons of light. Their salt-flavored life in a way I had never seen before. What a joy it was to study God's word daily, to grow in his grace and knowledge, to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. That was nearly 20 years ago. As I have grown and matured in the Lord, this one thing I know. The battle for our heart begins in the mind. If we allow Satan to fill our minds with the things of this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, then our hearts will be drawn away from God. <coughs> if we spend our time watching the things of the world, whether on TV or at the movies or elsewhere, if we daily listen to the music and talk of our anti-Christian culture, our hearts will be drawn away from God. The things of this world have no place in the home dedicated to the Lord God. The things of our ungodly society have no place in our minds or in the minds of our children. The Lord has richly blessed Louie and I with two lovely daughters. We can do no less than dedicate them to God and his service. We will not allow the things of God to be crowded out of their minds by things that are impure unlovely and dishonest. If we are to stand fast in the Lord, then we must think on things that are true, honest, and just. What is more true, honest, and just than the word of God? Amen. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Amen. We must think on things that are pure, lovely, and of good report. What is more pure, lovely, and of good report than the word of God? The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. God never intended for his law to be a list of do's and don'ts. It was always intended to be a law of liberty, giving us freedom from the darkness, the weight, and the consequence of sin. It has always been his desire for his people to write his law on their hearts. For a law which is not on the heart 
will not be lived out in a life of virtue and praise to our Lord God. Amen. Through his loving grace, God provided a way for his law to be written on our hearts. Oh, how I thank him for loving me so much that he gave his only begotten son that I may have eternal life, that through him I might be saved. But God's grace does not abound in order that sin may abound in my life. If my mind and heart are filled with the love and grace of God, there is no room for the sins of this world. When I was baptized into Christ, I was buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so I walk in newness of life. Amen. My old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. I no longer serve sin. Covered with the blood of Jesus and filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, I am now the servant of the living God. Amen. To present myself as a living sacrifice is merely my reasonable service unto a holy God. Amen. I am now his workmanship, created for good works in Christ. Oh, how I pray that my light so shines before men that they may see my good works and glorify my Father, which is in heaven. Amen. How I pray that my peculiarity shows forth the praises of him who hath called me out of darkness into his marvelous light. If he loved me so much that he gave his only begotten Son, can my love for him be any less? The church today is living under law, and they're struggling not to sin. Those of us who have awakened to God's grace have no desire to sin. Amen. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim, is higher ground. Amen. Amen. Our desire is to live a life totally committed to a gracious, loving God. Yet those, there are some in the church who are living under law that call us legalists. Because Christ has given me access to God, I am free. I'm not bound to any form of legalism, but I am free from sin and I am free to live the holy life that God desires. Amen. So I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen.